It's the Daily Dog. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Daily Dog. I am thankful that you're joining me today. It is a Friday and that means it is a Masterpiece Friday edition here on the channel. And I am happy to be going back into the vault for one of my Extended Play Lounge episodes. And the piece that we're going to be looking at today is Aqualung from Jethro Tull. I recorded a, um, a full-length album reaction to this album as my Extended Play Lounge episode number 12 and released that back to our Patreon community back in mid-January. And uh, I very much enjoyed it. In fact, I realized <clears throat> I had only heard like two of the songs from that album previously. So much of it was a first listen for me and I found it to be quite poignant and really, really uh, fascinating. So uh, here's a little bit of information on it. This is the band's fourth album. It was released back in 1971. On the surface, if you're not really paying attention to what they're saying and you're just kind of listening, it's a groovy record. It's got some catchy tunes. Um, it's got some poignant tunes. It's got a mix of electric and acoustic sounds. But if you dive underneath, y'all, uh, it is a smart and really thoughtful exposition on uh, religion, on one's uh, spirituality, um, morality, ethics, and how we reconcile all of these things as we experience the world around us. And um, you know, this this far, uh, it's it's what it was. It was released in 1971, so it's celebrating its 51st anniversary this year. And it's the best-selling album by this band, still, of their entire discography. And it has received long-time critical acclaim as well. Um, like I said, uh, I listened to the full album, and that is available on our Patreon if you want to go take a look at that. But today, I am including the opening and title track, Aqualung. And then we're going to skip to the last two tracks on the album, which, had, which includes uh, Locomotive Breath, and uh, the song Wind Up. And I'm also going to, uh, to include my original wrap up to this album uh, reaction because the experience of listening to that whole thing really prompted some uh, deep uh, thoughts from me, some, some theological responses from me, and uh, I would love for you to hear that. So uh, I listened to the Stephen Wilson 40th anniversary remix version of this and so i am happy to share with you from my previously recorded extended play lounge episode 12 three selections from aqualung by jethro tull i can't think of anything i'd like to do more on a cold saturday than just hang out drink some tea and listen to a great album okay so it's going to be fun we're going to start with aqualung <laughs> and uh, and see how we think. So let's let's start it off. Here we go. Classic, right? Sitting on the park bench, I little girls with bad intents. Snot running down. I'm going to stop for a second. I don't normally do this right at the very beginning, but I need to talk about that riff. I mean, how cool is it to start the entire album with that riff? Um, I should have got over the piano. It starts on a D, D, G, B flat, C, then D flat, back to the C. Bow, no, bow, no, bow, no. So you got two different kinds of Ds in that. And um, it, it, it gives it a bluesy sound. You got the the main fifth of the key. We're in G minor. Bow down, bow now, now, now. Five, one, three, four, flat five to four, right? And then that two different time types of fifths um, could be uh, construed in knowing uh, and going through all the lyrics that they've put together. Uh, a way for us to um, have. Here's the conventional reality or the conventional wisdom that you're used to, and we're taking a slightly different approach and challenging it a bit uh, by the two different types of fifths that are tied to that tonic note. So take that as you want. I'm going to keep on rolling, and let's have some fun. Like a dead duck. 
besides the riffs, the, uh, the harmony is all over the joint. It's been a long time since I listened to this. This is harmonically less uh, just disparate. Major four, minor four, flat seven. I like the effect on the voice. The mixing is great so far. I have no complaints. I mean, we're in pretty capable hands with Stephen Wilson, right? It's almost like the way that the voice is mixed, or the effect on the voice, it's almost like hearing like um, a warning through the AM radio, like the classic stuff, right? It's like hearing... Major four on the C, then C minor. Need to break out my jump or tall dance. Remember that from from Thick and Simple Break? It's been like half a year since we've done some Thick and Simple Break, so I'm happy to get back to some jump. Change it to a minor four. It's a slower uh, take on the same stuff they were doing before, harmonically. That's just your, your famous one to the six to seven. the acoustic stuff, especially against the uh, the electric guitar solo. Don't you start away uneasy, you poor old sod, you see it's me. It's a little too shifty. It's hard for me to really catch everywhere it's going. Greasy fingers smearing shabby clothes.
spitting out pieces of his broken life. That's the first song. I I had a little bit of a moment where I'm like, I think I know what an aqua lung is, but I wanted to make sure. An aqua lung is a breathing device for people who dive. And so why is he called aqua lung? <laughs> um, and what I found was that Ian gave, uh, uh, it's based on this homeless man, uh, right? Uh, the, in the picture. And I read that Ian actually like, posed for that and 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 then the painting sort of um gave it an interesting feel based on that photograph but it's this homeless man that in the uh story uh, uh he gets that nickname because of perceived breathing problems you know sitting on a park bench eyeing little girls with bad intents not running down his nose greasy fingers smearing shabby clothes you know it's it's they're looking at uh and recognizing uh, the um, the people who are living on the streets and um, just uh, noticing them and uh, uh, trying to figure out um, why they're there and uh, and what kind of person they are you know and uh, and taking stock of oneself right and noticing how uh, I may be in a completely different situation than this person uh, but what really does separate us, you know, it's it's an interesting way to start an album And then my friends we get to Locomotive breath the next to last song this one. Of course I have heard by the way uh, Since Aqualong uh, none of these songs sound uh, uh, Sound even vaguely familiar to me so I'm sure that I haven't heard them before and I love it. It's really, really wonderful. I'm enjoying myself. So here is Locomotive Breath. Here we go. I don't remember piano at the beginning of this. Mm. Lovely appoggiatura in the high voice. Too bad they couldn't get a tuned piano. Has to be on purpose, slightly out of tune, just for that sound. Cool that they saved the bass this long for uh, in the intro. And the drums. This is how I remember this song starting. Hmm. Was that an, a radio edit? Or did I just miss that all those years?
the flute can play very virtuosically. It's not extremely difficult for, for flute players to play a whole bunch of notes. Trickier than it, than it even sounds, and it sounds really hard. position my headphones here did a little too much wiggling in that one uh yeah so apparently this one was about uh overpopulation and now like 50 years later the the world's population i think has grown by another full third so <laughs> you know not only are we dealing with dwindling resources but now we're dealing with you know uh climate change and this global political upheaval um, as, you know, all people all around the world try to get a handle on on the realities that we face. And um, we're coming to drastically different conclusions. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that uh, things in the next uh, several years um, go well, uh, but it's 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 going to be a, a challenging time. But uh, I have hope, my friends. Uh, that leads us then to the very last song called Wind Up. So we wound up here. <laughs> uh, it is, I, I have my heater off in this room so that the, the, um, uh, the sound of the heater running doesn't get in the way of the microphone. And so that's why I had my hot tea. It's cold outside, y'all, so I'm going to hold my tea a little bit. Mm, still hot. Uh, but yeah, it's getting chilly. Um, so let's get it, uh, get it on y'all. This is wind up the very last tune on the album it goes like this. Here we go. Hmm. When I was young and they packed me, interesting how they passed it from the piano to the guitar major three chord. How not one. to play the game? Five suspended to five. One. I didn't mind if they groomed me for success, <laughs> or if they said that I was just a fool. Hmm. Same progression. So I left there in the morning. With a god tucked underneath my arm. Whoa. The half assed smiles and the book of rules. So, this is what he learned. And I asked this god a question, and by way of a reply, he said, I'm not the kind huh. you have to wind up on Sundays. I'm not the kind you have to wind up on Sundays. So to my old headmaster and to anyone who okay. So to all my old headmaster. Before I'm through, I'd like to say my prayers. Huh. I don't believe you. <laughs> you had the whole damn thing all wrong. <laughs> it's not the kind you have to wind up on 
That's true. That's, he, he told me himself. I'll be damned. Huh. You can ex. Okay. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. This is brilliant, y'all. Um, when I have to read it to you. When I was young and they packed me off to school and taught me how not to play the game, I didn't mind if they groomed me for success or if they, they said I was just a fool. So I left there in the morning with their God tucked underneath my arm, their half-assed smiles and the book of rules, and I asked this God a question. And by a way... A firm reply, he said, I am not the kind you have to wind up on Sundays. So, then he's turned, so do my old headmaster and anyone who cares before I'm through, I'd like to say my prayers. I don't believe you. <laughs> you had the whole damn thing all wrong. He's not the kind you have to wind up on Sundays. So why the hell have you been telling me one thing when, when <laughs> it's so pointed and uh, simple? Will you can excommunicate me on my way to Sunday school and, and have all the... <laughs> it's just hysterical and brilliant. Uh, let, let's keep going. Here we go. Hiding in plain sight, you get sort of just sort of caught up in the sound of the song, and you're not even paying attention to what it says. But it's it's quite provocative, revelatory, you know. When I was young, hmm. and they packed me off to school, and they taught me how not. I didn't mind if they groomed me for success Or if they said that I was just a fool So to my old headmaster and to anyone who cares Before I'm through, I'd like to say my prayers Well, you connect Sunday school and have all the bishops 
then it, it ends acoustic. Brilliant. And it ends on a half cadence. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, just brilliant. Um, I talked a lot in this one, but there's a lot to unpack, y'all. So thanks for hanging out with me if you've hung in this long. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a great way to spend a Saturday, so I'm enjoying myself. A couple things. Uh, there's this one spot in this that even before the, um, I heard it, I uh, put it in italics. The line, how, how do you dare tell me that I'm my father's son? And I read that, I'm like, aren't I? You know, but he goes on. Uh, how do you dare tell me that, that, that I'm my father's son when that was just an accident of birth? I'd rather look around me, compose a better song, because that's the honest measure of my worth. It's another bit of lines that could be a verse we could all learn from. Uh, one major point from this last song uh, that I think he's talking about is that uh, in these lines specifically, it's um, a dumb idea that uh, we would feel like we have a responsibility to our parents and uh, our ancestors to uh, carry on their uh, religious traditions and continue to observe the same rules and rites and rituals and traditions even amid changing times, uh, changing and updated understandings of how society works, uh, of ourselves, of our environment, of our universe. You know, why should we be forced to uh, adhere to that just because it's what they did um, out of some, you know, perspective of reverence uh, or respect? Um, I think rather he's saying we should seek out um, truth without feeling like our path must include even major portions of what's uh, been understood um previously and uh that there's no need for this sort of dogmatic uh conformity uh as we learn uh lessons for ourselves in our own times you know uh we can be our own person without having to be uh a slave to uh the identity of being a father's son or a mother's daughter you know, we can be our own person, respect them, uh, pay homage to them, um, but uh, take what they learned in their lifetime and apply it to our own. And if we need to break away from some things because we find them to be uh, no longer valid or uh, no longer working for us in today's society, then it's... Um, only right to update, you know, 2.0, 3.0. I mean, as we learn, it only makes sense that we update the programming. Um, there's a lot of heavy stuff in this, uh, y'all, uh, uh, like societal and how it m mixes with morality and spirituality and religion and organized religion and what role it has. There, there's a lot to uh to unpack uh i work at a church that is that is not a um a secret i've actually i've been quite open about that i've <laughs> you know i've reacted to iron maiden from our sanctuary um i'll tell you a little bit uh, if if you're curious I'll, I'll say this for the very end of the video i've never really talked about much about my spirituality or or the fact that I, you know, um, how I came to work at a church, that sort of thing. Um, I was brought up in a very, um, what I would say, literalist interpretation of Christianity in the American South. 
Uh, I was taught that the Bible is infallible. I was taught that uh, it's a literal document. And um, I always had a fascination around it, but I never really, I think, uh, really believed that it was literally true. Um, my parents certainly do, and they come from that tradition. And uh, which isn't uh, it, like a liturgical church. It wasn't a Catholic church or it was, it was one of these American offshoots. And uh, as I got into college and started doing music, um, as choral musicians, we sang a lot of, of, of uh, religious music, music that was written for uh, churches. Historically, especially in Europe, to be performed in large cathedrals. That's the, what these ensembles are designed to you know, spaces that these ensembles are designed to fill. And uh, I fell in love with the sound, and uh, I began this kind of long journey towards not re like having a background in reading the Bible several times as a kid and like going to, to church with my family uh, every week, sometimes twice and three times a week at my entire childhood, to then shifting into like when I was in college and not really, I didn't need to do that anymore. I got paid to be a, a baritone section leader in a church choir uh, while I was, and it was a pretty good side gig, especially for uh, a person who was going to school to study music. And I liked the sound of it. And over time I had to figure out like, uh, you know, am I, Am I going to go into this? And so when I needed a side gig, I'm like, hey, I can direct a church choir. I know a bunch of the hymns. Uh, I know how to play. I can conduct. It's uh, I, I can do this job. And I've and I've uh, served a couple of different churches over the years. Uh, but I will say this, my friends, uh, I have come to personally view uh, the Bible as um uh, a document that I almost read it instead of reading it as uh, a historical document that's infallible or the inspired word of God. I read it like a comic book. Um, the stories in it, if I've learned anything from the Marvel universe over the last decade or so, is that these characters and these stories that are fantastical um, can um, uplift the human condition because when we separate um, observable reality a little bit uh, in our storytelling, it shows how we're all the same instead of like a biography or something rooted in observable truth, which is going to be like something about like a specific story. But when we go like, you know, this person can fly or it's the man of steel or it's Thor's hammer or it's Frodo in the ring, you know, and Samwise Gamgee or Aslan, the, the, uh, the lion, you know, it's these, uh, mythological sagas that become morality plays for us. And, it, and, uh, trust me, if you've ever been to a comic con, this is real to these people, the stories, the characters, it's, it's as real to them as anything. Think about Harry Potter right? We can learn a lot from Harry Potter uh, and the stories uh, uh, of friendship, of how we all need to work together, of unsung heroes and, and being yourself and all these sorts of things that, that, that people can learn from. And, uh, and so when I read and hear the Bible told, the stories of the Bible told, I think if I remember to think of them the same way, or to receive that information, the same way that I would receive uh, a comic book story. It allows me to see into the universal truth that's embedded in the story <clears throat> and not be caught up on, did this really happen or did it not? And in the end, it doesn't matter. It's, it's the way that humans tend to, I think, learn best. It's through narrative storytelling. And uh, one of the things that Ian has been talking about, especially in the second half of this album, is how um, that adherence to that um, 
without um, questioning and without curiosity and with that sort of blind allegiance that can be um, misused and he's pointing and he's recognizing that and pointing it out rather uh, beautifully and um, you know especially uh, you know almost two years into the pandemic uh, and not a whole lot of people are going to church anymore in America at least that's what our experience is and we have found new ways to, you know if you go to um um hike on a sunday morning you know you know church is a is a loaded term is a loaded word for a lot of people but that's their church um that's their time to recharge to uh to reconnect to um to run a diagnostic so to speak and get reconnected to priorities it can be anything it can be playing a game of golf you know, it can be hanging out with your buddies. It can be taking a stroll. It, it can be uh, swimming laps. It can be uh, reading a book and getting immersed in a story. You know, all of those things are are those times where we sort of um, reflect, right? That's really what it's about and creating community. So that's one of the things that I've tried to do uh, here at The Daily Doug is just be open and as honest as I can about things that I see and I learn and I can learn from all of you uh, as well. And I have, I can, I learn from you guys every day. So uh, I've gone on a little long here at the end, but um, it's what felt right. So uh, I've had a great time on this one, y'all. Uh, Jethro Tull's Aqualung, I've never heard that all the way through. I've never heard uh, most of those songs. Nine out of the 11 songs I've never heard before. And um, they're up there for me in terms of bands that as I'm listening to stuff, I'm like, yeah, that grooves with me, like in my personal uh, musical aesthetic. It's, it's really, really smart. Um, and um, I want to listen again. So I'm going to cut this off and thank you all for being with me on what the hell episode is this episode 12 i need to get back to i have 10 pages of notes with all these lyrics in here yeah this has been episode 12 of the extended play lounge thank you all for hanging out with me and we will see you next time on another edition of the daily dog